Okay, folks, uh, let's get started. I think we, st we do have a lot of to cover, but you know, so last time we stopped here at pooling, right? And you know, we will get into more of the convolutional neural networks. But I got a few questions on Slack, and you know, I just thought you know I will add these questions here and you know explain uh, you know and hopefully you know give my answer and maybe it benefits everyone. And then after these four questions again. Maybe I will wait. If you have more questions, let's you know get them out uh, right away, and then we'll continue with the rest of the uh, you know CNN part. Okay. So the first question was uh, you know so there's a confusion, right? Like what is the purpose of validation set? Right. So we have the training set. We use the training set to find the gradients. Why do we have a validation set? Because you know there's also idea of a test, set, right? So. You know, we discussed about all these hyperparameters you have. Right? That is the learning rate, uh, you know, the model architecture itself. But then, you know, the type of regularization you will do, you know, type of activation function you'll use. Maybe that's part of the activation function. function. So, you know, these are the common hyperparameters. Now, you know, you could, now you can't use gradient descent to find these things, right? So you will pick one of, you have to first pick these values, then you will do a gradient descent. And for a given set of values, you will find the best model given the training set, right? But like we said, you know, you could be very unlucky and you could have picked a long, uh, you could have picked a wrong learning rate. So, you know, and that's why we have to, you know, sweep, uh, this is the word they use, a sweep the hyperparameters. So when you sweep the hyperparameters, how are you picking the best model, right? Because if you're using your test set, right? So say I only have training set and uh, uh, training set and test set. So, you know, each time I pick a learning grid, I use my test set to determine how good it is, right? Used to uh, find the best, and now if you do this, you have no idea how good this model does on, you know, because, you know, like, let's just say you have 10 hyperparameters with four choices each, you have like so many different combinations, right? Uh, and, you know, you know, even though you are not really using gradients, you are kind of overfitting on this test set, right? Because if you ran, if you did maybe 200 different, uh, you know, sweeps, then among the 200, you are picking the best. And that is best for this given set. We don't know if the same same parameters would be still be the best if you had more data, right? So that's why, and plus it is not a good idea to then try to you know, optimize on the test set. So what people do is people use validation set to pick the hyperparameters, and then they use test set to really confirm if the if the model plus hyperparam are still good. Now the question is, what happens if you use a validation set to pick the perfect uh, you know, hyperparameters, and then you go to test it, and the results are not that good? It means you you know you, uh, the model has failed. You cannot go back again and again try all of this and again come back to test it uh, and again come back to test it. Once you have seen the performance of the model in the test set, that's it. That experiment is over. Now, if you if you have to go back, you'll have to redesign another test set because you don't want to keep using your test set to peek into the results. Like it's almost as if you are you guys are giving a, a quiz. And each time you submit an answer, I tell you whether it's right or wrong, right? So then you can just sit there all day, all night. You can just keep figuring out until you get all the answers right. That doesn't mean you uh, you know this stuff. The same thing here. You don't want to use test set and then go back to, to training again. That's why people use validation set because uh, now validation set is almost considered tainted. There's no value in, in using validation set to tell whose model is better or not but uh, at least you can use a validation set to pick the other parameters. So often people will do a, a split like this, like 60. Of course, oops. 
Of course, it depends on uh, the size of the data set. You could do 80, 10, 10, but often people will do 60, 20, 20. But if you don't have a, a lot, you know, this could also become 80 and this could also become uh, 10 and 10. So this is how people do it. So it's always a good idea to keep a test set separate. Now for MNIST, you know, uh, it's okay because you know, nobody actually takes you know, results in MSV seriously, but if you do go and operate some, you know, like real machine learning data sets, you would want to have all these three and you don't want to touch your test set until you have decided on everything related to your model. You have trained the best model, then you go to test set, look at the results and, that, and, and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's a pass or fail. If it's a fail, you cannot use the test, same test set again. So does this uh, answer your question? Uh, does anybody here, here still have uh, doubts on why do we, or when do we use uh, use validation set versus test set? Uh, I have a follow up question. Yeah. Um, so, so say in the real world, right? You know, your boss is going to be expecting a model. You know, um, so you go through, you you use your training set, you use your validation set, you get something that's working fairly well and you happen to run the test set and it performs very poorly. Can you essentially shuffle the data? Um, you know, what's in training, what's in validation, what's in test, and then try again, or like what's, so you can, what's the approach? Yeah, so ideally you cannot, right? Because that whole data set is, you know, you, there must be some, so if you do and test it bad, the idea is that this data in itself is not sufficient, right? You did everything that is possible, so you cannot go back to the same. So if this whole thing is a data set, you cannot go back to the same data set because you know now if the, then otherwise you are just saying, oh, I got unlucky with my test set combination because you know I see this often. You know I worked at a company where we were you know we are, we are trying to get you know FD approved uh, you know ML based models right and people will like and if the test numbers are bad, we're like oh maybe I just got very unlucky with this test set. What if I restarted? What I suffered it? But no, but the idea is, the, and that's why you randomly split. And that's why there is something which is very important is you you want your data to be IED, right? That is, this should be independent and identically distributed. That is, if I look at samples from test or validation and training, this should be indistinguishable. I shouldn't be able to tell them apart. It means if the model has learned on training and valve, it should work on test because it has same distribution properties. But if you believe that your test set has different properties and trained well, then it's possible that your result will not be at good. But the problem is you are breaking the, now the fundamental requirement of these, these splits that this should be identical. The only way to do this is have all your data set in, together first and then randomize and then suffer. But you'll be surprised that you know in most other practical cases, you don't have access to test data while you are doing all of this process. You just hope that eventually when the test data comes, it looks very much similar to training and valve. But if that is the case, uh, then it's fine. If that is not the case, then your test process will be bad. And those cases, it is okay to reject test set if you can show that test set doesn't, it, uh, is not ID to training and valve. But you cannot go back to the same set uh, just because your test set is bad. Uh, I mean, FDA or any, other, or any other regulatory body will not allow that. Uh, the main go, the the golden rule is uh, test set has to be only used once. That's it. No, never a second time. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Let's go to second one. So, uh, what layers or other parts of our data make it an MLP, right? So, I, you know, maybe this is this is definitely on me. Now, MLP is same as saying network of dense layers, right? And, you know, now actually very, very rarely people use the word MLP these days, you know, right? They will either call it as, uh, you know, fully connected uh, network or, you know, uh, a network of dense layers, or they will call it, uh, you know, fully connected. It, um, right? So it is. Uh, these are the same things, right? So multi-layer perceptron just means that you have you know multiple uh, dense layers, but no other layer specifically denotes this. One way to differentiate this is if it has convolution layers, then it is not an MLP, right? Or uh, that's the, so. The, that's the only distinction that you need to remember. 
because if it is convolution people then you we think of it as convolution neural network and you know then if then there's something called as um, recurrent neural network we will study that next week but even that would not be considered mlp, MLP is basically your dense layers but again this definition is just you know just uh, like arbitrary there's no strict definition but uh, if you have to i would say think of it as uh, you know a, a network that consists of uh, dense layers only the one we saw an example last time i think uh, with um, i forgot okay it was with the with that website where you could draw the diagrams right so this and like i mean uh, what about other layers that are so these are you know like the main learning layers right there are you know then you have other layers like dropout right or you have bats you know, today we'll study of uh, bats now uh, you know or you know you might have some other uh, like max pool so these layers uh, because they are not uh, they are not they are not necessarily learnable layers these layers don't matter they can be in either of them right uh, so therefore, you know, if you have fully connected layers, then you call it multi perceptron. If you have convolution layers, we call it convolution neural network. And if you have recurrent neural, uh, recurrent layers, we call it RNA, which we'll study next week. Does that answer? Uh, is there, does anybody still have any doubts? Like because you know this uh, terminology is mostly you know as a guide. Like there's no like a real hard definition for these things. Okay, let's go to another one, right? Okay, uh, figured out incoming outgoing layer needs, right? Uh, okay, figure out incoming outgoing layer needs adjusted to match the flattened layer. Those seem to necessarily get enough. So I don't agree. I don't think Keras can do that or wants to do that, right? Uh, because, um, you know, what does it mean to automatically figure out incoming SAS outgoing, right? Because Outgoing shape depends on incoming shape. Right? Now it's possible. Right? So say you are designing architecture, you can leave uh, some of the shapes empty, and the model will uh, try to infer those shapes based on uh, uh, based on the previous ones. But still, there are a few things that you have to provide. Right. So for example, okay, let's look at this notebook. Okay, so say, uh, you know, let's, okay, let's first look at MLP, right? So let's say I'm, my input feature vector length is 100. I think for MNIST it was what, 74, but let's say I have, you know, 100 features, I have two classes, and now input save will be what? So input save will be differently. I have 100 features, so it will be 100, but how many, I don't have to say, right? Because, you know, the, that is, that uh, can be left arbitrary, right? So you can definitely leave the one of this empty because only this is required. Let's say in layer one, I have 350 neurons. In layer two, I have 50 neurons, right? So now this is required, right? In each layer, you have to tell how many neurons there has to be, right? So all I have to do is I have to provide at least something that is what will be the number of features. And you can see here, you know, the uh, other side is uh, blank, right? So the input shape is 2D, but I'm only giving one of the values. And then I'm giving how many neurons here. I'm giving how many neurons here. And I'm giving more classes, right? So I'm not giving any other input output shape. And when I do model that summary, uh, you can see here automatically it has figured out the shape of this, right? Because shape of this is none. None means because that depends on what this shape would be, right? If this were some fixed shape, that shape would come here because this is uh, left alone. The model can work with any shape. I can give, uh, you know, while training, I can give this this to be 100 or this to be 200. It not matter because uh, the shapes are determined by the number of neurons and then the uh, missing shape is is you know automatically figured during runtime right so if your question was you know, does it figure automatically run time kind of yes but it is very important for you to know what the shape will be because you know like numpy and other stuff they almost always try to force the shape and see if it will fit and oftentimes you'll be surprised that you do, like you may you may not get an error and model might just you know reshape this stuff and it might be feeding wrong input all the problems i've seen initially with design architecture is where people have got you know, incorrect shapes so i'll personally encourage you to you know like when you write like this you just commented out that what do you think the shape would be here right because now it is 350 neurons so there will be some number and then there will be 350 right and then here again, we don't know what that in the first number will be because that depends on the 
other size of the input, but uh, the other output will be 50. So if you come into code like this, and then later on, if you see something, you won't be surprised on why the output is like this. Right now, you know, like, but if I talk more about layer needs in the sense of talking about, oh, should the model be able to figure out oh, instead of uh, three, you know, how do I know they're supposed to be 50 here instead of 100? Those things, like, those are very hard. Today, uh, we will study later on around efficient net. Uh, yeah, it's a very comp a very advanced type of neural network, almost state of the art. And that actually was designed to basically learn those, uh, those, you know, intermediate values, but you can see that's like a very advanced and complicated type of network. Keras automatically cannot do that. So does that answer your question? Or does anybody still have a question, uh, doubts on this? I hope this answers uh, that is fine. Okay, sorry, let me read the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's come to this. Uh, a number of parameters came from, but I have how many number, how the numbers in my model came from where come. Okay, so let's, you know, just walk through the calculate. So, so by the way, there's, there's one more function, which I don't know if you guys knew about this, under keras.utils, dot vis underscore utils, there's a function called as plot model. And if you give the model file, it does this plot, and also you can ask it to say so the shape, so the layer name, so you can also see the incoming shape, outgoing shape, incoming shape, outgoing shape. So this this also allows you to debug. Okay, let's try to compute uh, you know manually the number of parameters in this network, right? So in the layer one, right, I will have uh, how, the number of weights will be equal to what the input shape plus one for the bias, right? multiplied by neurons, because this is a simple matrix multiplication, right? So, you know, the, the number of neurons on this side and the number of input on this side, because, right, this is crisscross. So input multiplied by output. So the number of parameters in layer one will be, uh, the, you know, the input say plus one multiplied number of neurons. So it's uh, three, five, three, five, zero, right? For layer two, it will be what? Now for layer two, the input is, is the output of layer uh, one, right? So that is layer one number of neurons plus one, again, for the bias, multiplied by uh, layer two number of neurons. So that is this, right? Again, if you want to double check, you can check, right? Let's see what is value of this. What is the value of this? 350 and 50, right? So if I do, uh, so if I do 351 multiplied by 50, right? It is 17550, so we're on the right track. Similarly for layer three, again, whatever is input plus one, that is for the bias multiplied by, in this case, you know, the number of neurons is same as number of classes, right? So three. So now if you add layer one, layer two, layer three, you get 53,002, and you can see the number of training variables with this, right? So uh, this was very easy. Maybe convolutional neural networks are slightly hard, right? So, uh, so let's uh, try to make one. Now, in case of, you know, images, you know this is x y this is height width and the number of channels right so let's keep this fixed now for each layer you have to decide uh, two things right what the size of the filter would be which you know if you have no idea stick to three by three or five by five and how many filters uh, do you want to learn so let's say we want to learn 32 filters in layer one so let's give the filter size same for all the layers in layer two let's learn 64 and layer three, let's learn 64 again, right? So now uh, the way we will construct this model is, okay, sequential, let's do con2d, you'll say number of filters you want, give them filter size, and you know you can add the activation and only in the first layer, you have to give the input shape. For the other layers, if they are connected, it figures out the input shape from the, uh, from the output of this. You can manually change it, but it'll automatically figure this out. Maybe this is also part of the, Previous question again. You know, let's let's add max pooling so that it reduces the spatial size by half. Now let's add the second con layer, right? So this is number of filters in this one. Let's add max pooling again. Now let's add the third con layer, right? So now if you do model summary, you can see here uh, the output shape is is thirty by thirty by thirty two, right? 
uh, 30 because anyone big anyone know why the why the height and width is 30 and not 32 uh, after the uh, applying the filter the size becomes less exactly right so if you if you want we could change that you can see here it tell, tells you what type of convolution to do right so you can say padding right one of valid or same right so valid means no padding right and uh, same means uh, the the, uh, the output will be the same size it means there will be the the number of padding will be automatically determined by uh, the input size right so let's say um, Padding. If I do padding as same, now let's see if the mod, what the, oh, sorry, sorry, this padding has to go inside here. Now, if I do model summary, now you can see here, the output shape has changed. Now is 32, right? Because we have added the padding, right? Okay. So uh, now remember, because this is convolutional networks, the output shape does not depend on the on the xy input coordinates it, it does depend on the number of channels but not on the x and y right because that is where this idea of fully convolutional comes in and which will be very important today because all the object detectors you know segment you know segmentation models they all rely on the fact that you can pass any size right here let me show you that like this here so what happens if i do this none and right so i'm interested in not giving the x and y coordinates and, okay anybody care to guess what will be the output shape of the first convolute if i do model that summary so so before uh you know we still have padding right before we got the same output shape because padding was same so the input shape was 32 by 32 and now there's no input shape uh what do you think will be the values here none as well okay let's see you can see here is uh, none as well right because it, this whole uh, this whole model can take any number of images right that is the first dimension any height any width as long as it has uh, you know the fixed number of in, so there's fixed number of in channels three and then you can see all the intermediate shapes they are also not fully defined they will be defined during runtime, depending on whatever shape you give, right? If you give a 10, 100, 100, uh, 3, this will be 10, 100, 132. It will be 100 because we have the padding, right? So in, the, in this way, you, you, know, you can see the shapes will change. But let's compute the, the number of parameters. Right? We see that you know, there is um, 896 par parameters. Even even here and even here, if the uh, the number of parameters is the same, whether you do padding or you don't do padding, they have fixed shape. If you have different shape, the number of parameters still remains the same, right? Because for convolution layers, we know that the padding depends on what, right? So first of all, you know each filter is a three by three matrix, right? Because that's the uh, that's the size size of uh, your single filter, right? So a single filter is three by three, right? And now this is uh, multiplied by, um, uh, and then how many incoming filters you had? Incoming filters you had three, right? And how many outgoing filters you are learning? Thirty-two, right? And plus, uh, you know, you have number of biases also. So for each outgoing uh, channel, there is one bias. Let's look at the figure here. So. Let's look at this, right? So here we had, uh, I thought we had, okay, let, this is a better one, right? So here when we did, when we learned six filters, we also ha had to add, you know, six different biases to each of the channel. So that's how it's implemented. But you will often find that, that, that most of the practical you know, networks, they have started to omit the bias layer, right? So if we, uh, so this is for the bias, right? And if you if you multiply all of them, you get you get 896. That is the number of parameters here, right? Now let's do the parameters in the second layer, right? So the again the filter size is same, three by three, right? Now for the second layer, what is the number of uh, uh, number of channels, uh, right? So the incoming is incoming is 16. Uh, so incoming is 32. 
outgoing is how many did we learn in the second one? 64, all right. Or did we learn 64, right? So we learned 64 uh, plus 64, right? 18496, 18496. Sorry, the, this is max pool. Max pool doesn't have any uh, learn parameters, right? So you can see here this is 18496. So how does this, uh, how did we get here? We got here because this is your filter size multiplied by uh, incoming channels multiplied by outgoing channels. Outgoing channels is the same as number of filters, right? Plus outgoing channels. Well, the better way to write this is do this plus one. Filters. Right? So this is a formula. And of course, the, the, there's a divide by number, divide by stride. You know, in all of these cases, stride was one. Right? So when you do this, you will get number parameters here, number parameters here. And if you add them, you will get this. So I hope, that, and you know, I will share with you this dog, you can play with it, and you can also draw, you can also plot the diagram and see the shapes. But uh, I hope you know this helps you to get the idea of you know, how the number of parameters came about. I will share it after the class. Okay. Let's see, the bias is something I wasn't thinking through. So when doing multiple so 28, I was losing track and then I had the problem with this error. Okay, so okay, clearly bias. And again, if you want, just omit the bias. If, if you see con 2D layer uh, function also, it says, um, you know, whether it's con 2D or dense, you will see there is uh, option to not have bias. Uh, there is an option not to have bias, something uh, use bias. If, uh, by default, it is true. You can just say use bias equals to false, and you don't have to worry about the bias. Okay. Okay. So, we uh, let me see any other question in the chat. Okay. So, uh, any other questions regarding you know the size of the parameters or you know different between MLP or continual network? Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question regarding the if we compare the dense uh, network and convolutional mm -hmm. in the dense through back back propagation and optimization we updated weights mm -hmm. if we use that analogy in convolutional networks is it the values in the filters that we need to update Correct, exactly. It's the values in the filters that we will track here. I will show you uh, um, how to get the weights. Exactly. So it's a filter. Filter values are the weights. It's just that in uh, dense layers, they, they are they are nicely organized as a matrix, right? In this case, they are organized as a tensor because it is multi-dimensional, right? So if you do get weights, right? So okay, let's just do. Layer by layer. So if you see, so you can see here the the weights that are actually being changed, up, uh, prop, you know, uh, are back propagated are basically uh, instead of a matrix, it's a tens, it's a four D tensor, right? And again, the, this four D tensor because the first two numbers are the size of the kernel, then it is incoming. How many channels is incoming? And this is how many filters you're trying to learn. So you can see, so for, uh, for the second layer, you can see the way so you have a shape of, oh, oh, sorry, this is actually bias for the first one. That's why uh, sometimes it gets confusing because it is stored as like this. For the second layer, it's actually like this. So it's here now, again, the, the kernel size was same, right? Three by three. Now it had actually 32 channels because that is the output of the first one. And we are learning 64 filters. So the actual weights that are get, getting changed are like this you can see here the weights like this and you know you, if you want you guys you guys could i don't know if you uh, guys know about tensor board has anyone heard of tensor board so you can actually you know uh, like when you write a code you can uh, push the values uh, of, from keras to tensor board 
And TensorBoard is basically a tool provided by TensorFlow, it works with Keras, and where you can actually, of course, see all your accuracy plots. And more importantly, you can also see the um, weights and activations. So you can also see the histogram of weights. So how does the weights change over time, right? Because we initialize the weights to be like, you know, like a normal, but then as tuning progresses, so like this, in this, in this graph, uh, you know, in this graph, all the way back is, uh, uh, you know, zero iteration, and all the way in the front is the, uh, is a higher iteration. And so in this case, you can see the weights didn't change much, right? Uh, in this case, you can see the weights uh, is changing. In this case, you know, weights was all over. It got all accumulated. So you could, uh, if you just Google uh, like this, Keras at TensorBoard, and you should be able to see. And you know, you can see. I thought there would be weight. Okay, I can share with you as uh, you know, like a piece of a code that will automatically add all the weights and activations to TensorBoard, and then you'll be able to. Uh, does it add to TensorBoard directly? Or yeah, maybe it already has a callback. So you can in the callbacks, you can, oh, here you go. So in the callback, when you do model.fit, you can just give the callback as TensorBoard and you can just import this. And then this will allow you to see the actual weights that are changing over time. It's a good idea to try to see the weights and see what was the difference between this situation and the last situation. What is the difference? That difference should be basically your learning rate multiplied by gradient, right? And sometimes it's a good idea to sometimes hand compute them and see if it helps, uh, you know, connect the dots. Any other question? Okay. So, you know, now the other thing which, you know, which we haven't seen before, but is, is used a lot is called as batch normalization. Right? And um, now, you know, this happened because, you know, when when CNNs were first discovered, discovered, and you know when people started stacking multiple layers of convolution to make really deep neural networks, and that's where the idea of deep comes. The deeper you you got, uh, the deeper your network was, more powerful it seemed. But it turns out that there was you know after a certain point, uh, adding more layers didn't help, or the you know the learning of the layers wasn't going as good. Because you know, remember there's a problem that if you're doing gradient computation by using backpropagation, right? Um, and you are using chain rule. So you're multiplying the gradients from every layer to every layer, right? So you get these problems where these values will get very small or they don't get propagated. Or in the other way, you know, like it's a very loose form of seeing it. But if you think of all these layers as blocks of Jenga, each layer is in a slightly off because you know, then they are not perfect to because the distribution of the data is slightly different for at each layer, and therefore you know they are unstable. Now you know this is just a you know uh, sort of help you understand that's not what happens. But but this is the idea of you know, there's a covariate shift. That is the covariance in each of the layer changes a lot, and therefore you, you the learning of very deep network is unstable. So if you in your assignment, I don't know if you tried, but if you really try to have a few number of neurons, but have really a lot of layers. At some point, that layer didn't help, and that this is because you know you didn't use batch norm. So in batch norm, the idea is very simple, right? This comes in between layers, right? And the purpose of it is to basically you know align all these blocks to make it you know more uh, with to have a very similar distribution, if you will. So you you first compute your mean and uh, your variance, right? Um, uh, and then, you know, so this is just for here, actually just the incoming data, right? And the incoming data could be uh, 2D or 4D, depending on, you know, whether you have fully connected layer or convolution layers, whatever dimension it is, just compute its mean, compute its uh, uh, variance. And now for each of the data point, you know, do like a standard normalization, which is also called as Z, Z normalization, right? That is subtract by the mean divide uh, by the uh, by the standard deviation now the reason ep small epsilon is added is because what if this number is zero right but you might say oh how can the variance here be zero uh, this number will be really very very small and uh, sometimes you know your computers will uh, if the numbers are very small they just get uh, uh, you know the, the numbers are just changed to zero right that depends on the precision and these things aren't trained with the high precision 
So if you're only using like eight bit or 16 bit, it's possible to get a zero and you know, divide by zero error will happen. So just to avoid that, you add a small epsilon. So what you have done is you have taken incoming layer data X, you have normalized it. Now, so far, so good. This is not the end of it because you know, this kind of normalization was already done before. Uh, this is to be called as a layer response normalizes. That is after every layer, we just try to normalize all the input values by. So what is the goal here? Like if you do this, the X hat is has basically a mean of zero, right? Because you're subtracting the mean and it has a unit variance. So this is a nicely centered uh, ball. That is all the data is always on the X, Y with a very nice uh, variance, right? So your data basically looks like uh, so say your data initially looked, um, but how do I draw here? Okay, so before, if you um, say before your data had, you know, some distribution like this, after doing this, your data will have a distribution that will be a perfect circle. So you know, this is this is what is called as a z-score normalizes, right? Now, it turns out this is okay, but there is a problem in doing this, right? The problem is if you make all your data to, to have a zero mean and unit variance, you are restricting what kind of features you can learn, right? And that is not good because, the, because if you are really trying to solve complex problems, you need to have, uh, you know, you need to let the model really learn any arbitrary feature because what if the perfect uh, activation or the perfect numerated value for this task looks uh, you know something like this right you know maybe maybe it is more important to have features separated on the x than the y what if that is the case if you do this it, uh, it won't work and what if having a mean zero is not ideal maybe in this case i want to have an offset mean right so if i want to have like this it's not possible so then the simple idea but the key idea was once you do this kind of uh, normalization right that is unit norm now you allow it to scale and shift by arbitrary amounts so you can see here this is x hat multiplied by gamma and you are adding some beta so here the um, so the difference between X hat and Y. Uh, is this. So your X hat will always be what? Uh, what did we say? X hat will always have a mean of uh, zero and its uh, variance will be one, right? So it'll always be a perfect circle like this. Whereas after doing this, now Y could have some shift. That shift is the beta, right? And so this beta is the uh, vertical shift and the scaling is your gamma. So you are now allowing the model to scale back, right? So the scaling and the shift, uh, now this gamma in beta, how do you determine this gamma beta, right? Because we don't know what it will be. Because like I said, the model, maybe the best uh, scale, you know, um, uh, mean is somewhere here. We don't know, right? And that is where the idea is, why don't we let the model learn? So gamma and beta are also trainable variables. So while doing back propagation, you'll also you know, update gamma and beta. Remember, mu and sigma are not trainable variables, right? They are just statistics. Whatever your data is, mu is the mean of the data, and sigma is the sigma square is your variance. But uh, gamma and beta are just random learned variables. So you start with X, you get out Y, they have the same dimension, but now it has gone through two steps. One, it has gone through normalization. Second, it has gone through scaling and shifting, arbitrarily scaling and shifting. And this thing in a batch normalization is kind of changed, revolutionized the whole CNN because after this, people could really train very, very deep networks and very, very fast. And this paper, this technique got very famous. The inventor is from Google and he also got really famous. And this one technique, really changed uh, the whole you know, space of uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. So in your networks, I would encourage you to have a batch norm after every convolution layers. Okay. And you know, we did study about dropout, right? The same thing dropout can be applied 
in convolution layer also you know now in convolution layer it is not ideal why because you know each filter is already small three by three so if you drop one value it changes a lot so in modern times people don't use dropout as much uh, with a convolution layer as they used to do with fully connected but that doesn't mean you cannot use and you not get any benefit you can use you'll get some benefit but it won't be as big a benefit as you got with uh, you know fully connected layers you know so now you know let's put together everything we have learned individually and we'll see how these things are used to construct what we call as a modern uh, you know deep networks so we we studied a convolution layer we know the difference between valid convolution and same convolution and also we know that sometimes convolution can have a stride of more than one and then we know there is max pooling again to refresh the purpose of max pooling is to reduce the dimensionality right and the the reason max instead of average is because it turns out you want the highest activated signal rather than the average of the signal right? and it is uh, it's very empirical but max pooling seems to work a lot more than average and again dropout is dropping some layers as so dropping some filter weights or even the whole layer or even a whole filter and batch norm is where you know so what we studied here is just called as a standard batch norm there are slightly other modifications other types of batch norm where you know in this case question is when we computed the mean and the variance uh, i say i was saying mean across what the, the dimension i right but if your data is remember in your con if you're doing convolution layers you have basically your data looks like this right your data has data has x y also it has number of channels right so you know do you only want to normalize across channels you know which is the standard batch norm or do you also want to normalize so you know there's a group normalization which says you know instead of normalizing across the channels why don't you yeah, let me just copy paste this okay let me just write here so why don't we just make a small group here you know and then we, do, uh, we just normalize uh, the values in this group separately they normalize the values in this group separately this group separately so you, you divide your, your your whole block into number of groups or there's idea around just doing the whole layer normalization that they're normalizing across all dimensions and you know they all have some merits you know if you're interested you can you know google them and read the papers about it but think of them as a special cases of batch normalization in fact actually more general case but these are more niche not everybody uses them but you know just in case you guys are experimenting you can try them okay so now that we know all these four types of you know uh, constituents overall you know any convolution neural network will start to look like this right so you have input data you have some convolution layer you have max pooling you have convolution layer and in the end you will add a fully connected layer because Typically, we do this for classification, right? And for classification, you need some fixed number of output neurons. So if I'm doing MNIST, I have I need ten. So I will flatten this output here, and then I will do uh, another dense layer of ten, and then you know that will be out. Sometimes people will do two fully connected layers uh, because this flattening will be very high. So you don't want to have a fully connected layer where you know it basically is going from you know like because if you flatten it and say so you have thousands of value and you have 10 class and you're learning this 10 this kind of fully connected layer is not ideal because you know a lot of these neurons are connected to very few neurons and they don't they don't tend to work really well so you know this kind of very uh, this kind of uh, stark difference not good. that's what people will do is they will add another fully connected layer in between just so that you know instead of going from like 10,000 to 10 you go from 10,000 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10. And this just, you know, again, empirically speaking, seems to do better. So you, you, you shouldn't be surprised if you see multiple fully connected layers at the end. And I will show you some real famous, uh, you know, converts where, uh, where that kind of pattern will exist. But overall, this is the structure. If a task is regression, one dense neuron at the end, correct, exactly. If the task is regression, then just add one dense, you know, a single, uh, just the, the number of uh, output here will be one, and then that value is a regression. And, and again, you don't have to again use density. You can simply take all this, flatten all this value, and just take average or take max of that. But you will see that, you know, having a final dense layer really improves the classification or regression problem. Uh, and you know the, the, there might be the case where 
you know, you might already have already trained a convolution layer on something. So you freeze this part of the network and only train the fully connected layer because, you know, you're moving from one data set to another data set. So that, uh, so for example, if you're trying to take a picture of a house and try to predict the price of it, uh, you don't have enough data to train on all house images. So initially you will take a CNN that is trained on some image classification network like this, and then you'll only update the fully connected layer while optimizing over the house prices. So this is what is called as transfer learning. Uh, and it is, uh, it is very widely used, especially in domains where you don't have a lot of data to train everything. Okay, I think we lightly touched on this last time, but you know, let me go over this again. It's like all these, you know, multiple uh, convolution layers, right? What are they learning? Why do we need multiple convolutes? So again, it turns out this is again by coincidence, not that we designed it like this. By coincidence, it turns out that the if you see the first few layers of CNN, and again, remember this is not this is not this is not literally first layer, second layer, third layer. This is some arbitrary number of layers. This is, I think, first or second. This is um, maybe seven, maybe 10, or this is like 20. But again, if you go to this paper by Matthew Ziegler and Rob Forbes, this paper actually has which layers they used. But if you look at the first few layers, the kind of the filters you see are very similar to S detectors, which we saw earlier, or like just a color detectors. So these are also called as Gabor filters. It's a generic name for this kind of low level you know, signal, uh, signal extraction features. And if you look at the mid-level uh, filters, they learn, you know, some like motifs, like some shapes, you know, like some circle, you know, some edges, multiple colors, you know, or, you know, like multiple edges. And then again, you use those things and then com combine them you know, to learn the more complicated abstracts like you know, wheels or roofs or eyes uh, and honeycomb and, and that sort of stuff. But again, remember, this is purely coincidental. We didn't go out of design like this. But it turns out that is what uh, layer learns. So the idea is that each layer is just uh, you know abstracting away the information to higher semantics, and by the end uh, you have just learned uh, you know what does a car look like, or, or, or what does a bird look like, or the features that that make it a bird. Okay, so you know this way now you know let's look at some real uh, CNN uh, architectures you know with like exact details. Now, LeanNet is the most famous one. This is what uh, Jan Lee Cohen proposed uh, while he was working at at and to, I think this was used to scan your checks uh, to, to read the numbers and this did really well. And remember this was before even batch norm or dropout was, it was invented. So you can see here, this is a very simple where you have convolution layer, you have max pooling convolution, max pooling convolution, then fully connected, and then you know he had six classes, so another fully connected. So in the end, you get one by one by six, right? So it doesn't matter. So your input is the third, and it is a grayscale. So there's no, there's no uh, three. There's only x one. So this is what it was uh, used. And uh, you know if you want, you know in Kera, this network is already there. You can actually use it, but it will not do that well because this was a long time ago. This was in nineties. But this is what is called as LeanNet. But it's very small and very easy to play with. So I'll definitely encourage you to you know try this. If you are not using GPUs, if you're only using CPUs, this is a good type of network to play with. Linet 5 is I think the specific the, the exact name of the type of the network. But in, you know, from 90s until 2010s, there was a lull because people couldn't go beyond you know five, six layers. And that is when you know uh, this uh, AlexNet came about. It won this. The, uh, there's a competition called as Large Scale Image Recognition Challenge, uh, often called as ImageNet. ImageNet is a data set, but there was a challenge on top of the data set where you have this thousand classes. And until then, you know, people were using all sort of complicated models, this, that, but Alex Kuzowski and, you know, a few other folks from University of Toronto, I think, or Mila, uh, he was a grad student at the time. They designed this, uh, you know, uh, this network and you can see, uh, you know, like even the original figure is not that clear and there's no other copy, but this is actual diagram. You can see your input, con, max pooling. And like I said, there was normalization layer, not a batch norm, but just a standard normalization layer. Con, max pool, norm, con, con, con. Other thing it doesn't mention is this is also when first time ReLU was used instead of using uh, soft uh, sigmoid. And uh, you can see this is the first time when we had, you know, um, multiple layers of con and in the end there was two fully connected layers right one 
4096 neurons and the last one 1000 neurons because there were 1000 classes and this uh, particular architecture won the uh, competition by a big margin i'll show you the numbers but this and after that and this is what is called as the birth of model, modern deep learning because after this people were like yes deep learning can do more complicated stuff and you know it can really be arbitrarily deep and as you can see in 2012 when this uh, remember this whole competition is announced uh, you know winners announced around november by the time people learn about architecture it was already january and the, the competition again starts in march there was only a couple of months but in that couple of months, someone saw this and had an idea like, oh, you just need to go more deeper. And just made, you can see the difference between, see the figure at the bottom, this uh, what it called as VGGNet, but AlexNet, the only difference is more conv layers, right? And the more fully connected layers. There's no other innovation, it's more just deeper because now people realize that you can just make it more deep and it'd be more, it'd be more powerful. And again, all the details of architecture is here. I'll let you guys study that on your own time, uh, you know, and again, there is different variants of VGG, but VGG was really famous because as you can see, and it has all these conv layers and it has all these FC layers. So when somebody gave you a VGG network with all its weights, now you could simply extract this, you know, let's say this, uh, you can see the second FC layer output is 4096. So you can take a, you can take an image, pass through this model, take the output of the uh, second to last layer. So now you have this vector of 4096, right? So each image was reduced to this vector. And then this, this, is called, this is what is called as embedding. So now people could use this embedding for many different purposes. And you'll be surprised in medical AI, that's what people do, whether it is an X-ray or CT or, you know, uh, or pathology or your, um, uh, colonoscopy, any kind of imaging data, because you know, we don't have, because, you know, it, uh, ImageNet data set has millions of images to train such a network, right? This network you can see has uh, how many total parameters? It doesn't say, but it is in like millions than the total number of parameters. So nobody has that kind of data. So we take VGG, which is already trained. So we and the, the, we just pass in an image and then get this 4096. So now all the images are reduced to 4096 vector size, each image. And now you can use in you know, a simple uh, SVM or another simple FC layer uh, on top of that 4096 to train new things. So the VGG was a birth of uh, transfer learning. And that's why VGG was really popular for a long time. And it was very simple to understand. There's no complication here. And VGG uh, you know, has really good results, but that year it was not the VGG that won, right? Because this idea was very simple. Let's just take this and just go deeper. It had good results, but it did not win the competition. The network that won the competition is called as Google LeanNet. So you can see that it's like a homage to LeanNet and also adding the word Google. It is by the team of the people Google. And this is where the batch number was also invented. And, and you can see here this, you know, before all our networks look like a one line, right? One chain of thing. There's one input, it's, uh, you know, that input is fed to one layer, its output is fed to another layer, its output is fed to another layer. But now suddenly you can see it's kind of getting complicated where the first few layers, simple linear structure, then the output of this layer is fed to three, four different uh, layers. And remember in, in, in this diagram, all the blues are convolutional layers, all the uh, red ones are max pool layers, and all the yellow ones are fully connected layers. And the green ones are, I think, just some normalizing layers. So you can see here, this from uh, the output of this layer is fed to four different ones. And then for the timing, this network spreads. Each of them has its own connection. And then it is all brought back together again. And then again, distributed again together. Because before, you know, this is the, uh, in other words, this is, this is what is called as a network in a network. So you, uh, you can consider this part as a mini network in itself. So if I were to call this as a block, then and then this whole thing will start to look like again a single line because all of this will be replaced by a uh, layer called as block, right? And you will you will see that that became really powerful and all the modern architectures use that idea that uh, a, a separate small network is considered as one layer, and then you know then those layers are tied together. But you know, still there is idea of directionality. The data is fed here, and the output is going here. But now you might say, 
what is going on here, right? It looks like something there is some flicker and delay here. And this is where, you know, this idea about gradient uh, vanishing comes in. Like I said, you know, when you have really deep networks and when you're trying to do the back propagation, right? When you start from here, remember the, the gradient for this layer, you know, it comes by, it comes by doing the, uh, the, uh, by the chain rule, right? So it is, each layer's gradient is multiplied, 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 multiplied. So say my gradient was 0.1, right? And if I have 20 layers, right? So 0.1 multiplied uh, 20 times is how much? So I can't do it. Why is it not visible? Oh, there's a, okay, let me write down here. 0 0.1, if I multiply this value 20 times, this number, if you do it in your calculator, is so small that probably it will be considered like a zero. Or even if it's not zero, that value will be insignificant here and therefore gradient will have no impact, right? So this is what is, this is a classical problem in deep learning. It's called as gradient vanishing problem. And the reverse might also be true. If a gradient is like 1.1, and if you had to multiply 20 times, this number will be so big that you know you will get an overflow error and then it'll become like infinity and then you know you'll just get nans because you know this number is not a number that you know, it's almost too big for the variables that is used to store them so this is called as gradient exploding problem so so when when they're trying to do this really long deep architecture they realize that that by the time the gradient comes uh, here it is getting very, very small. So they are reinforcing the gradient by adding another loss layer, right? The same thing here as in, you know, you again, you have the same output, uh, same, same Y, but you also add a loss which is coming from here. And then similarly, you add a loss from here. So the gradients coming from here will have higher values than the gradient coming from here. So they are supplemented. So, you know, this is a reasoning. And I remember this is still several years ago. This was what, 2014, people still, learning behavior of deep learning, they're still trying to figure out, but you know, they came up with the solution that seemed to work, not only work, they won the challenge, they won the classification, detection, segmentation, everything they won and became really popular, right? So they, they innovated three things. One, idea of a network in a network. Second, I think this is when batch norm came and this network had batch norm. And third, adding this multiple, so loss value, is being added at multiple points. But it turns out this is not always necessary, but of course in hindsight, we can tell that. But uh, at that time, this was the only way to train very, very deep network. And you know, of course, as named the idea is, you know, every, uh, you know, remember compared to every other net people, Google's network was just so deeper that nobody even had compute power back in the day other than Google to really use it, right? And you can see here, you know, each of this, like I said, you can consider as a, like a one block or a network, and it's just a you know, network of networks. Okay. Now, you know, let's look at what this internal, that network, this block circle looks like, right? So like I said, you know, because, so say this is the previous layer, that value, the same value is copied four times and then given to one uh, convolution layer whose filters are of size one by one, here filter size three by three, here filter size five by five. And this, you know, comes about because when people were designing VGG, there was a lot of fight about what should be the right filter size. So between VGG, you know, B, C, or D, what you will see is that it's ultimately the filter size that differs. And some people could not agree, go like, oh, you need bigger filter size to capture bigger objects or bigger, you know, motifs. Some people are like, no, no, smaller filter size, but having two layers is enough. But people could not settle and they said, you don't have to make the choice. You can learn all different types of filter sizes. One by one, three by three. So one by one is like really just each pixel is converted, right? This is just like, you know, scale just uh, transforming each pixel. Three by three for small objects, five by five for bigger objects. And three by three max pooling where maybe even one by one is too much of information. You want to reduce the, so this is almost like one third, right? So we are taking one third of the pixel information. So, so information at one third of the pixel, information at one pixel, information at three pixels, information at five. So you learn convolution at all different layers and then you just concatenate all of them. Uh, so, you know, before we were learning n number of filters, so the output size was, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this breadth was the number of channels. Now this number of channel is the same, but some of it is coming from one layer, some of it, sorry, from one network, some of it is coming from another network, some of it from, from, is coming from another network, right? So let me see, let, let me see if I can, 
quickly. So let's. In the meantime, if you have any question, please ask now. Because this is important to understand because you'll see all the modern architectures, they all you know just implicitly do this. Oh, okay, here, sorry, I already have this. So what does this mean, right? So you can, uh, so you know, so you have basically four of them, right? One by one, three by three, five by five, four, and the pooling. So you do the convolution. So, so let's say this, uh, these are the outputs of each of these layer, right? And now you basically just tag them side by side. So you go back to your a single tensor, but just at the channels, you know, remember they, they need not mean anything, right? That is you know, the first, uh, you know, 10 is coming from this, let maybe the next 10 is coming from this. Is there any relationship between 10th channel and 11th channel? No, they are just concatenated, but they are just more information and each of the information is filtered slightly differently. And therefore, you know, uh, we want to use them all. And that's the idea here. That all of this is concatenated, so uh, again you are going. You are going back to one uh, tensor instead of four tensors. Okay, so you know again this is the, this is the actual free, you know structure of the network. Um, again, I will uh, let you guys look at this on your own time, but definitely try to study and see the output size, the number of parameter size, and but and you can also go and read this paper. It's easily you know it's it's nicely written and it's easy to understand. And you know this was 2014. In 2015, you know the idea again the problem you know this whole idea of gradient uh, propagation uh, and you know so gradient vanishing and exploding was rethought. They were like, do we really need such a complicated solution where you feed in the loss at different points? Is there another way of doing this, right? And plus, uh, you know, the uh, inception it was deep, but it wasn't still that deep, right? I think this if you if you, if you think this has one layer probably it is like 20 layers maybe, right? But then if you see what happens, I mean, CIFAR 10 is a popular data set that has like colorful images, but very, very small size, like 30 by 32 pixel. And I think that, uh, and I will give you one assignment on that data set. Uh, and in that data set, if you see, if you see on the left-hand side, and remember this is the error, right? So lower is better. And, and you know, the even though training error was low, the test error, which you want, you know, is the real test, 20 layer network is doing better than 56 layer, right? But that uh, goes against the idea of the whole idea of, you know, deep learning, more deeper is better. That's what we have seen. But if you do this with the, like simple vanilla, you know, just having convolution max polarity layers, and if you do 56 of those, in 56 is usually far worse because there's overfitting going on here and the network is not training properly. And there is this idea called as rest nets, and I'll I'll tell you what the idea is. And in rest nets, that uh, the behavior, the way you expect, is restored. That is, 20 layer is worse than 56 layer, which is worse than 100 layer. But of course, you can see here there's diminishing return, right? So if you go from 110 to 200, there's hardly any difference. But going from 20 to 44, there's a huge difference. So just by doing one simple trick, they were able to take this vanilla. Conrad structure, which we studied here, right? This simple structure can easily be scaled to 100 layers simply by doing one trick, right? And the one trick is whenever you have this, uh, you know, conv layer, whatever layer here, take the input that was fed to the conv layer and add that input also to the output, right? So basically, you know, before we had what X, there is some some layer that you know learns the information there could be multiple layers you know who cares but this x has been transformed to h of x right so in each layer you have transformed the input and then you forget the input you can delete the x right but restnet says no, no no don't forget the input your new output is basically your current output plus the input and when i say plus i literally mean point wise addition right plus so so you need two things. One, you need the space, the shape of X to be same as F of X. So you can see here, it means you cannot do a valid convolution because if you do a valid convolution, F of X will be smaller than X. So you always have to do a uh, same convolution that's convolution with padding. And if you do that, the shape will be same and you can point wise add it. And so, you know, this is, this is what this is called as a skip connection or also called as identity connection. Um, and you know, at, at, at first it seems very puzzling. Like why, why, why just adding the input to this output? Uh, 
you know, solve such a complicated problem. You know, let's try to understand uh, what, what might be going on, right? So uh, this is your 19 layer VCG. This is your 34 layer plain, uh, you know, CNN, you know, just a column layer stacked, not just like VCG, but just more layers. And this is your 34 layer, you know, rest net that is with residual connection or with skip connection. Now, let's see what happens during backward pass, right? So when we're doing the gradient computation, earlier I said that for this layer, right, the gradient, you know, because this is coming from chain rule, the gradient of this is multiplied by gradient of this, which multiplied by this, multiplied by this, 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 and all of this. There's some kind of, attun sorry, there's some kind of a attenuation of gradient at each step, right? So if it starts from one, at each step, you can expect you to lose some values. So by the time it reaches here, it's very, very, very small, and, and plus it's getting multiplied by smaller values. What if there was an alternate path for the gradient, which doesn't get attenuated? Remember, and, and here attenuation just means loss of value, right? We're saying loss of signal. So here, well, I'm, now when I'm doing the backward pass, of course, uh, one gradient will flow from here, you know, from a layer, which will get attenuated, but the same gradient will also flow from here, right? Because I also have to take the gradient and give it to this point. So when you come here, right, let's, um, draw this, change the color. So, so at that point, right, you are getting gradient from two different places, right? One of the two places you are getting gradient one from this arrow, and one you're getting grain from, from this layer. Maybe there is a better way to draw this. Okay, let's do this. Okay, I'll, I'll just do this, right? So I'll just show you that you are getting grains from this and this. Now, the grains from this one, you know, is going to get attenuated, right? Uh, so that is right, because that is bad, that is small one. But the gradient from this one is not getting attenuated. Why? Because it is just an identity, x, right? If I compute, if I do, uh, if I take a gradient of this, it will be d of f of x plus d of x by d of x. So this is just one, right? It's an identity. So its gradient is always going to be one, right? It means its gradient is not getting attenuated. It means whatever the origin gradient was, that stays. And because of that, now I'm basically adding a small and a large value. It means I'm getting a large value. And then same thing here, same thing here. So no layer has to uh, go through at least you know, more than two layers before it gets this unattenuated or the skip connection, grain from a skip connection, right? So that you can see every layer gets, you know, it has, you know, um, has uh, not every layer, but, but most layer has access to uh, gradient that comes from this path, which carries the necessary information. Again, this is explanation. There is no proof of it. Nobody can prove these things because these are, you know, like highly non-convex lossscapes. There, there's no math designed to prove these things. People have done some tests, some analysis, uh, but mostly it's empirical and the explanation is mostly intuition. In fact, this architecture was just found by brute force by searching through a lot of different techniques. And when this seemed to work so well, this explanation was provided in, in a, like a post, uh, post hoc analysis. That is, oh, why does it work? Maybe this is why it works. And then I think uh, overall, you know, I am kind of satisfied by this explanation, even though uh, I would have loved to see a real mathematical proof, but there's no way to prove this. But uh, this is, but just doing this one trick seems to help. And you can see here if I buy the results, it does so much better. And FYI, in 2015, ResNet won the same challenge and won by a bigger margin. So let me see. So then instead of point zero, it would be point zero. Uh, uh, so it won't even be point zero 0.01 multiplied by 10, right, uh, Kyle? So let's see what happens, right? So, so let's take any arbitrary layer, right? So let's take... Um, Okay, from here, you know, let's pick any one of the layer, right? Let's pick, uh, so remember there are only two, uh, two types of layer, right? Either the layer is connected to a skip connection or it's not, right? So this layer is connected to skip connection, this layer is not. 
if you take a layer that is that is connected to skip connection like uh, this layer right in this case the grid will just be point to uh, it will be uh, let me write it down here it will be yes 0 0.1 multiplied by how many layers it has gone through let's say 20 plus 0 0.1 I know you're just assuming zero point is a version variant, but this zero point one is coming from this black line, which is zero point here, zero point here, zero point here, zero point here, zero point here. It is getting one, which is like this, but the other one it is getting getting is zero point one. So in this way, even though if this value is close to zero, this value is not, so it is effectively getting the grid, right? But there are other layers which are not going to skip connection. This one, right? But this one is getting gradient from uh, from this layer, right? And you can see the previous layer was not attenuated uh, because it had non attenuated gradient. So this one is getting you know, 0 0.1 multiplied to the power of two, right? Because in that there's only two, uh, at most only two layers you have to go before it gets attenuated. So this is still not a very small value and therefore it works. I know this is, you know, this is still uh, oversimplification because in each layer there is, you are adding a lot of values, but overall that is the same. So instead of point, you know, uh, one to the power of 10, you are basically getting 0.1 or 0.1 to the power of two, right? Because no layer is, now, yeah, if you didn't have one of this, uh, this skip connection, then probably you would have some layers in between who would not get uh, directly, but it is still not 10, it is much smaller. Does that help? That does, um, but then I got, I guess, a follow-up question. So if we look at that, um the second bump going from left to right the second skip uh this one uh, um this one. The, that one the one you're on right now okay. um so if i have say my um original input like so say we're talking the mnist data i've got you know a picture of a digit mm -hmm. as a as a tensor um that going in um Obviously, that's going to get carried through on that first loop, right? That's that's what's getting carried through, mm -hmm. and then that same image, the original image, is what comes through on the second loop, or is it the output of one of the layers? Uh, yeah, that's a good point, right? So that definitely depends on how you implement it. In reality, it is not implemented like this, right? Because if you do this the way it is shown here it looks like it's the same input that is going all the way to the down right? and if you do that then you know if your if your original image was of size 200 200 by 200 we're still left with uh, with something that is 200 by 200 here that is not ideal because classification you want to reduce the dimensionality as you go so in reality uh, the implementations look something like uh, damn i thought i had the actual uh, I'll show you what it looks like. So in reality, it looks like um, see they don't see because there uh, there is a concept of block and not every block is connected. So this this you have this skip uh, maybe this is a better one, right? So you can see here there is a skip connection block, but not every block is connected, and therefore it is not the same input that is going. Uh, this is also not uh, okay. So here, the, the the ones which are dotted lines are the ones mm -hmm. that is not connected. So it is not the same input that's going. So in this case, so so say if the if this dotted line doesn't exist, right? It means right. this blue line is basically this output of this, right? The input is lost forever. Okay, perfect. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, in reality, it is not the same thing, but in this case, because okay, so this dotted one is not connected. So at this point, it is the output of this layer, right? And then the output of this layer also goes here and also goes here. And but the same thing goes here, same thing goes here. Oh, here it is color coded, right? So you can all these, so all the pink ones are getting the same input that is, uh, that is output of this layer, but this one, uh, but all the blue ones are getting the same, right? Because they, uh, this one is not getting the same input as this one. Okay. So, and again, this is the actual, you know, the different structure. And if you're trying to implement it yourself, you will need this. But, uh, you know, Keras and everything, they already have all these architectures built in. You just can call keras.models and ResNet, and you'll get ResNet with the weights, without the weights. So you don't have to actually implement it manually. And just to give an example, you know, the number of, see the, see the performance of the architecture. So 
all these bars are your um, error, right? So lower is better. So in 2012, when Alex not won, you can see it went from 25% error to 16%. And then um, in 20, what? The, 2013, wait, I went VGG is 2014. I thought VGG was, okay, maybe VGG won in 2014. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's Google Net, that won in 2014. 2013 was actually another network called as Overnet or something, which is very similar to the AlexNet that won. And then VGG won, so VGG didn't win, but VGG and Google Net, net this is a small difference, but, uh, and between this and this, you can see error again went down much, but, but also see the number of layers, right? Google Linet had 22. This one had 152, right? So the number of layers you can see for at Alex now it was eight, eight, 19, 22, 152. So that's where this idea of depth comes. In. But you know, often uh, it is often you know looking at just the, just the layer to tell how big a network is is sometimes um, incorrect because you know the total number of parameters could be separated in different ways, right? So VGG, yes, VGG had only 19 layers. But it had really fat layers, really thick layers, and then a lot of neurons, a lot of uh, filters. So here, the size of the bubble represents how many uh, you know operations you had to do, like how many computations you had to do, uh, you know, like more multiplication, addition. So bigger means more energy you had to spend to do the same computation. And I think that is uh, sorry the uh, the um, the the x-axis is the amount of computation. So further on the right means more computation you had to do. And the size of the circle denotes how many parameters, right? So this biggest one is like 155 million and smallest one in it are like 5 million. So you can see here, of course, more parameters you have, more competition you have to do. But in terms of number of layers, this is a lot, you know, this is only 19, this is 101. But even this 101, it has fewer parameters and it has fewer computations. So you can, you should always look at the, this, this kind of curve before you judge, uh, if it is fair to compare VGG and ResNet. Okay, and now um, you know I will I'll try to quickly go over some of the other architectures, and then you know we'll see how much time we have. DenseNet came about after uh, ResNet, where they just took the one idea of oh, if there's a skip connection from one layer to another layer, why don't we go skip connection from that layer to every layer, right? And that is the idea here. It's not strictly the same because it's not a skip connection because here you are not pointwise adding, you're just concatenating these channels. But the idea is that the information from earlier layers might be useful later on because when people analyzed these uh, you know, really deep networks, what they saw that some of the outputs here really resemble some of the outputs here. It means the network had to relearn the same thing because that was useful, what we had learned earlier. And therefore, the idea is that, oh, if this feature is already useful, you just pass it the forward so that future layers don't have to relearn the same thing. And therefore, you could have now you could have a much uh, thinner, like more uh, you know lean networks. And you can see here in comparison the other number of parameters. Red is ResNet, which is which has more parameters overall. Blue is DenseNet, has less parameters. And you can see even though it has less parameters for a different number of layers, it is still has a lower error, right? And the same with the flops means number of floating point operations. Again, in this case, you know the uh, the curve which is on the left hand side and lower is better. And that is what we want. And you can see dense net uh, is this. But again, this is sometimes is not uh, telling the full story because you will often find that if you go to Kaggle, go to any forums, go to fast air forum, people will always talk about using rest net, very few people use dense net. Because if you are doing this, when you are doing this computation, you have to have stored all these activations, right? Because this has to be added. It means the memory required on the GPU for dense net is very, very high. It's so high that it takes a very long time to train and you can only train very small networks and if only with small batch size. So even though theoretically it looks so nice, practical considerations make it dense and harder to use. There is a version of dense net called as memory efficient dense net, but it is still, it's still not memory efficient enough. Uh, just so you know. So that's why even though this looks good on paper, in reality, you, you'll be better off sticking with the rest net. And again, this, uh, you know, people just take um, multiple ideas, mass them together. So, you know, I told you about, uh, you know, network in a network, right? Which Google Linet exploited. And then I told you about ResNet, uh, the skip connection. Their idea was like, hey, these two are both useful ideas. Let's add them, right? So let's have a network in a network and also a skip connection. And this is what is called as aggregated residual block. But this is called as residual block. And that is called as ResNet. It was really popular at one time, but 
I don't think people use uh, it as much. But the other thing that uh, the other innovation after a while, which came about uh, and also then won the challenge, is uh, now instead of trying to figure out, you know, they're like they said, okay, maybe we have figured out the gradient problem. But maybe the uh, active, maybe the whole batch normalization thing. You know, this is when people were like not sure how to normalize is batch norm the good. They said maybe there is a better way to normalize, right? And they said, what if we take this block, right? You know, remember the output of every conv is a, is a it's actually a 4D tensor, but the other dimension is for images. So they are all same. So each image is a 3D block, right? A 3D matrix. So now you squeeze it. So basically you, uh, you know, apply some kind of like a max pool over height and width such that you only, so each, each spatial dimension is reduced to a single point, right? So this, uh, this whole X, Y is a single point. So you will have number of points the same as the channels. So you do that. Now you add a fully connected layer you learn that and now you use whatever you have learned this to rescale the same input so you can see this kind of starts to look like a skip connection but instead of just using the identity you are uh, changing the identity to to be a scaling values and use that to rescale this thing so the input is re being scaled it's almost like batch norm that way but this uh, is almost like a skip connection so this is called a squeeze and excitation network the idea is the information is getting squeezed here, it's getting excited here, and this works. Honestly speaking, you know, all these explanations are post hoc, but just that it seems to work. It uh, worked that they were able to win this challenge. But remember, the, they are winning by like 0.1, 0.2% accuracy. So it's not a big deal. So don't try to get this to working, but I'm just giving an idea that if you are you know, looking for ideas to explore, this is the kind of things uh, how people have explored. And uh, but you know, again, the recent times, the one architecture which actually came about and really uh, they said, okay, you know, Google had so much compute power. Google said, you know, instead of people arbitrarily deciding all these different type, uh, you know, this layer, this architecture, what if everything is decided by the by the network itself, right? What if we train the network such that the where channels, everything is a parameter, and it will spend millions of dollars in finding it. But we will find a perfect architecture uh, once and for all, and release it for the for the rest of the world. And that's what they did, right? Their idea is called as efficient net, because you know, like they said that there are you know good good benefits of having certain number of depth. Also, we don't know what the input size of the image should be, how many channels should be, how wide it should be. All of these parameters are added as a trainable thing, and we talk, we talk about meta learning, right? That's how. Is trained, and uh, I mean, in this case, it's not machine learning because the whole thing is is differentiable. So it's just as part of a network. Network learns to predict uh, the architecture, and then the architecture is trained, tested, and that is fed as a signal to the to the controller to design another network. Right. So the so there's one network that is designing the network, the, whose loss is coming by the performance of the of the network. So you can so there's like two step training process. It's really expensive. Like this is like multi million dollar training. And they did it, and uh, you know here you can see on the right hand side, you know now in, in, instead of error we have accuracy, so you want to be higher, and on the left hand side this is so much better than RESTnet, DenseNet, uh, NASNet. NASNet was just your neural architecture search, so if it's a net uh, is this where idea is that the, the whole thing scales based on depth, width, and resolution, and you can actually see what the architecture was on the FISNet if you go to the paper. At the appendix, it shows you the real diagram. Let me see if I can actually pull that. Um, and this is also a good explanation of uh, if you're still looking to read more, I'll show you what it looks like. I mean, this is, this is the kind of architecture that you know you should not try to hand, hand write the thing because it's so complex that you will definitely miss out. Where is that? I thought they, what? Did they remove it in the recent updates? I am sure they actually provided what the actual uh, architecture looks like. Uh, I guess not. But you know, if you just if you go to Keras, import the network, and then plot the diagram, uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, it's very complicated, very messy architecture that the, the, the that network makes. Um, but it is so much better that you know nobody can hand design the architecture that will you know be better than efficient. Net. So if you are going to use some pre-trained network do some task. Trust me, start with efficient net, and you'll not have to think a lot before you, know, you, you change stuff. Okay, so 
now I do realize that we still have a lot more. We still have some segmentation and detection to do. Um, so what I'll do is, you know, again, we are a little behind. So next week, I will start with RNNs. We'll see how much time it takes. And if time remaining, we will touch uh, on localization detection. If not, I will post a video uh, from, from the university where they have talked about, you know, how to do localization detection. Yeah, because you know it, it, it still uses the very same kind of a network but now instead of just giving the class you also have to be able to give the xy coordinates right so you know you have one part of the network that basically is a classification other part does a regression so this is so for a long time there's to be this two-step process but these days people don't do two-step process people do single uh, steps single sub detectors and you know there is some intricacies on how it is designed. So what I'll do is, but you know, again, you know, I do want to touch uh, on RNNs and because transformers are very important and you need to understand RNNs to understand transformers and you need to understand transform transformers to understand GPT and you and you know GPT is what people you know I, I don't know if you guys saw recently a Google employee uh, you know got fired because he started calling one of their big um, language models. It's like, it's like GPT is called Lambda, which was you know, very good in answering human questions that you know, they think it is sentient. By the way, if you guys want, there is like an open API to access GPT. Uh, and you, know, you can actually, uh, there's a free for like 50 calls per day. And you know, if you have used your student account, you can actually get more free. But you know, I'll show you some examples of GPT-3 because uh, uh, you know, at least I, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the examples, but to me, you know, having been in this field for a long time, uh, you know, it definitely starts to feel very, you know, like it has a good understanding of not just the text that is given, but of, uh, you know, the, the meanings and how to answer, right? So, you know, you, you give this a prompt is like you give an initial input, uh, you know, I'm a highly intelligent question answering about that, that, that what is human life expectancy in the US? Of course, you know, facts, it has memorized and give you the facts, right? But, uh, you know, you can also ask, um, you know, more complicated questions, uh, where is the value of, so, you know, you give all this input and it's very, where is the value of kings? It knows exactly because it knows how to trace all of that. So in the next uh, lecture, I would love to, you know, go a little bit on that. But, you know, if time permitting, we will, you know, come back to this, but I'll also share with you a video which will, you know, walk you through some of the, you know, object detector parts, segmentation parts. And if you have more questions, you know, maybe we can, you know, have a office hour where you can ask me this. But again, if we do have time then, I will want to come back and tell you guys a little bit more on how uh, these detectors are done. But, you know, I, some of these imp implements are more engineering than science. So there's nothing like a new, like all the component parts are very similar. Is that how you do them, you know, how you, uh, how you design them, how you feed the data. Because even today, uh, you know, most of the objects, what they will do is they will propose a lot of these boxes uh, like this. Where is this? Damn, I thought I had one photo like this here, right? So you can see all these yellow box. So, you know, in, in the test time, it will predict a lot of boxes. And in each of the box, we just do something called as non-maximal separation just to find one box that captures most of the object, and then you just throw away other, uh, other box, and then you just do that all over the image. But you know, there is some more subtlety involved there, but I think you know, we need to also be cognizant of the time and you know, learn other parts. So we'll do that. So, uh, so let's stop here. I will share a video, you know, feel free to watch that. If not, we can hold it until next week. Let's see how much time it takes for us to get through our names. And if time remaining, we'll come back to this. If not, uh, you know, you guys should watch the video and I can answer the questions on how to do object detection. Does that work? Let me show you one quick example on, but can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna play a video and you can see how is it. So YOLO, YOLO is like one uh, model that is really popular. Uh, and the, the guy who made this, uh, Joseph Redmond, is really amazing guy. So you also look at his website, and he wrote like he didn't use any of these libraries. He just wrote everything on his own. You can see, and uh, the best thing is it is so much faster than other things. Like all of them, other they take like you know a few milliseconds. So each you know 
you can only do each frame at a time and, it, and it's never real time. But when you're looking about, you can see you can do all these multiple objects running very smoothly on a video. So it was, a you know, again, this is still running on a very expensive GPU, but uh, even then it is real time, right? That was a big deal. And I think now the now the latest YOLO is V7, which is, I don't think it's, in, there was same version guide or something from someone else, but you can see it is that good. But what, for a long time it was, uh, you know, in like few, um, a few frames per second, but now we can definitely do at any rate at the video does. And oftentimes, you know, the, these, I don't know if you guys have seen some the face detectors on your phone or the stuff, they're getting really good. There is the mobile eye, um, comma.ai is a company that makes these devices that you can put on your own car to get some kind of a uh, self-driving experience because it is camera and does these things. Uh, so, you know, the, there have been a lot of improvements in object detectors and um, uh, localizers. But again, you know, there's more engineering involved. So unless you guys feel very comfortable with CNNs, you might also want to skip this for now. And you know, when you really have done more work, you know, the, the next assignment in the project, maybe you guys can visit it at that time. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, when are you going to release next assignment? Yeah, I will release it. Um, yeah, because I think on the, I wanted to do Arnon's first. So um, yeah, if you guys are all done with the first assignment one, I can release that uh, the, like sometime this week. Because I think you really need to understand, do you know more CNNs. Uh, you know what, maybe I will repurpose assignments so that it doesn't use uh, some of the things you have not seen. Okay. And you know, also for the final project, I'll try to release it as soon as possible. Because you know, in the final project, I definitely want you guys to you know put more time in the final project than the assignment. Because assignment is mostly for me to get you, uh, for me to make sure that you guys have gone through all the tools that will be required to do the project. So I will make sure that you know I add something new to the assignment too than assignment one. All right. Any other question, folks? Okay, if uh, no.